What's up, guys? How's it going? Welcome to another edition of Full Blast. I'm very excited about today's video. Um, so we're talking about being a single decider. I am a big fan of, obviously, well-roundedness, obviously, you know, using all the tools at your disposal. I think that people are capable of enormous growth. I think that there's, you know, no fixed mindsetness. Like, we have access to everything. Objective personality is just a map to help us get to where we all fundamentally want to go, right? So I've been doing a lot of thinking lately, a lot of thinking uh, on my on my personal channel, my Facebook page, um, and it sort of keeps revolving around this like single decider block that I have. And without getting too 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 far into the like, well, my childhood was mara mara mara. Um, the short version is. I happen to be a um, double decider, right? I'm an IJ, a cranked up IJ, but an IJ nonetheless. But I was also actively rewarded for being a double decider. So it wasn't like there was never any tension in terms of the tribe reward for my double deciding. It was always, you know two people were having a disagreement, I was always the diplomat to come in and say, okay, tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what you're thinking. I see the whole picture. How do we feel about this as a compromise, right? That was always the role I was slotted into. That was always the role that I was rewarded for slotting myself into. Um, and that was really, really useful in a lot of contexts but really, really not very useful when it came to like, I don't know, trying to make authentic connections with people. Um, you know, the ability to just prioritize the individuals, that is not a muscle that I worked very hard for most of my life. And I sort of, again, I, there are, I think there are a number of reasons for this. I'm going to stick with the, the ones that I know are specific to objective personality um, with the understanding that there is like all of the other nuance and mess that informed all of these things, right? So because I am an IJ, it means that I'm going to be naturally a little bit more predisposed to seeing both sides of a person issue, right? Which means, ultimately, that the people are never going to trump the system, the process, the thing. That's never going to be, like, the thing is always going to trump for me. And in my case, the thing is always the plan, the end goal, what we're working towards, right? The set aside our differences, AKA don't play the tribe drama game and instead play the thing system institution game. And one of the biggest reasons, if not the biggest reason, that I gotten so screwed up the past couple of years is that the part of my brain that is institutionally focused and driven, it just, it's been at odds with the other ways that I need to grow as a person. So it would be like, I am trying to, my, my system knows that there is a void when it comes to playing this decider card, but yet I feel obligated biologically, socially, physiologically, emotional, whatever the fuck you want to call it, to seeing the bigger picture, taking the long view, right? And a lot of that is just sort of, that's just language, right? But what it's really getting at is don't care about the individuals involved. It doesn't matter who you're in a relationship with. All that matters is that you are in a relationship. 
All that matters is that you're working towards marriage. To who? Doesn't fucking matter. All that matters is that you need to fulfill your societal obligation to being partnered up with somebody else. And if you aren't fulfilling your societal obligation to do that, well, then the tribe's going to leave you behind. So, like, the institution is what matters. Okay. Well, that certainly plays into my IJ-ness, but it doesn't... Uh, doesn't really make for a lot of lasting connections because what will end up happening is I'll get into a situation. It is probably most apparent in a romantic situation, but it has happened in professional situations. It's happened in familial situations, whatever, that I just haven't ever been able to like play that hardcore judgment decider call with a, without going through so many fucking steps to do it. And I the reason I'm bringing this up in the context of objective personality is because I watched the, the Aaron Alexander, I think that's the name of the guy. Uh, just make sure that I'm not stupid. Yes, Aaron Alexander, right? So I watched that video. I watched it a couple of times. Fucking great video. Oh, man. Like, that video is fan goddamn tastic. Highly recommend. Highly recommend. Um, first off, it is indeed a type that doesn't appear in a lot of places on the dock. It is absolutely something that I have been looking to learn from a lot. Um, so he is basically me and every... He is bizarro me in basically every way, right? So like Andy Samberg is bizarro me in the sense that we have the same savior animals, the same demon animals, the same modalities, the same functions and sleep last, except he is an EP and I am an IJ. So he's sort of bizarro me in that sense. This guy is bizarro me in that we have the exact same functions except completely flipped and he's energy dominant instead of info dominant like me. And he's a decider, not an observer. So if I want to learn how to do all of the things I'm trying to do in life where I've been leaving voids, he's the motherfucker to watch. Like I can hit basically anything I need to hit just watching him. If I need to learn, okay, well, what is, how do I get better at IPing? Watch him. How do I get better at Savior Masculine SE? Watch him. How do I get better at, um, you know, being uh, energy dominant versus info dominant? Watch him. Like, there's a lot that for my specific type that I can really mine from that. So I've been thinking a lot about his decider quality, his single decider, his tribe issue quality. And what's interesting about him is he is a skip, right? So he's consumed play. What I really loved about the video and what was really interesting to me to about watching Shave's process of typing him was that they didn't actually get to the observer decider coin until the end. That was, I think, it was either the last coin or the second to last coin, depending on how you wanted to find your turns. Um, you know, once, the, but they were, they were down to either ESFP or ISFP with him being either blast last or sleep last. Cause I knew that he was consumed play. Right. And I thought it was really interesting and I appreciated watching that because when you watch a lot of the, the single decider videos, that's the thing that's slapping you in the face, whether they're cranked up or not. Like, that is the thing that you're like, oh, that's a that's a lot of single decider energy. My goodness, right? And he wasn't really slapping you with that, which is, again, why I found it so interesting to watch. But when you really get down to it, when you hear him talk, when you hear him do the things, and I think part of that is because he is, you know, Elon Musk, you can see a little more because he's got that sleep consume. 
Obviously, somebody like Gary V, where he's just cranked up on the play and the blast, EJ fucking hammer you in the face, right? But with him, it's a little trickier. With with Aaron, it's a little trickier because he is, you know, consume play IP. So he's a little cranked up um, and has such a strong grasp of the ST. So he's not doing the consume sleep. I live in my own head thing, right? But there's that little bit at the end of the video where they're talking about how his big revelation from like licking the frog, whatever, doing the, the six minute psychedelic trip was that, oh my God, we are all the same. Like we are all one man. And I think it's really true. And watching him go through that process and talking about it and watching Shave talk about him talking about it, I was like, oh shit, that's, that's the game that a lot of people around me have been playing, whether it's the EJs or the IPs. And that's just, that's not been a game that I've been very good at playing. I'm not saying that it's bad that I'm an IJ, you know, slash EP, whatever, sing, uh, single observer. Because double deciding, who oh boy is that important? I bet a uh, 27-year-old Shannon would have loved just a sous of uh, of double deciding, right? But I think about, like, my struggles versus Dave's struggles, right? I was talking to somebody about this. I relate to them both, right? I relate to Shannon a lot because of her demon FI, Um Hers is at the bottom, but it's double activated, but it's still a demon. Mine's in the middle and single activated. So I'm like, yeah, we're dealing with similar kinds of issues there, right? Um, but also with Dave, like I definitely see where he and I were coming from. Cause like, it, from what I gather, like neither of us dated a lot in high school. Um, I was always a little better at school, like doing the school thing than he was, but like, a lot of our issues do come down to the fact that like we're not great at prioritizing individuals. Like our instinct as IJs is to clump people, which is great if you're a scientist, but not great if you're trying to be a person in life, which is why I like, it makes my heart sing anytime that Dave talks about Shannon or his relationship with Cody, like that shit warms my, cause I'm like, okay, thank God there is hope. Like it is possible to flip that lever and to be like, yes, this is a hill I am willing to die on. This is a person who I'm willing to like, you know, put it, you know, like die on the hill of defending this person or whatever it is. So, as far as the actual practical advice of how to do this, um, I'm gonna take it back to a little year called 1993. Uh, David Matthews wrote a song called The Best of What's Around that appeared on his 1994 album, uh, Under the Table and Dreaming. And there is a line in there that I have heard for years and it just never stuck with me. And I was always like, that seems wrong. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, and the line is, turns out not where, but who you're with that really matters. And in thinking about all of this and the processing and the COVID and everything, I was like, oh, I got it. I gotcha, that, that's what we're doing, right. Turns out, not where, but who you're with, that really matters. Got it, okay, that's sustainable. We can, we can work with this, I like that. And it really, in thinking about that and thinking about a, a number of different areas in my life that I've been wanting to try to fix and just haven't really been able to, the issues that I'm running, to in my, running into in my life now don't seem to be like necessarily type or even function or even animal related. The like 
That is not to say that I am a master of SF and NF by any stretch. But as far as the part of like, oh, right, I recognize that as a blind spot that I need to look out for. I can do that more often than not, right? I can feel viscerally when I'm getting too NT or ST about a problem, about a thing, when I am disconnecting from my own feelings and values and emotions and visceral body sensations, whatever. Like I can feel that. Um, doesn't mean that I always do anything about it right away, but now I'm at the point where I'm I'm conscious of it, I'm aware of it. Given this, you know, given the right situation, I can always go, all right, I gotta do this, this T thing for another five minutes, but then I'm but then I gotta do the SF to balance that out, or else I'm fucked, right? I've gotten better at being able to navigate that in the moment. But the, my biggest issue when it comes to type, uh, and again, they're talking about this in the video, the like, the, you know, breaking down a big monster type problem. Um, it wasn't in the Aaron Alexander one now that I think about it. I think that that was in the, um, what's it called? Uh, it, it was the one about like Zen and ego and process and whatever, whatever, right? Uh you know, the, the big, oh, fuck, where was I going with that? Um, oh, right, 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 the breaking down the big monster problem. Um, really, step one is acknowledging what the problem actually is. And because once you acknowledge what the problem is, you can then go, aha, got it. I need to write Okay, so rather than like turning my head and pretending that I'm better at the IP game than I think I am, assume that I'm not great at the IP game, which, spoiler alert, not great at the IP game, right? And what I had been doing is I had sort of been like obliquely accessing the IP game, which again, part of the process, and I think that for me, Approaching it in this way was really, really helpful, right? So basically what I did is I didn't go straight from, oh, I'm going to be like, I'm stuck in IJ observer land. I'm going to immediately not only flip the switch into decider land and be an IP. Like, no, that's too much. You can't, you can't go that far all at once. But what you can do and what I did is I was like, all right, I got to have some sort of concession here. And I know that it's the demon FI that's the problem. And also the demon SE can be problematic from time to time and the NF. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to archetype model myself after like a consume sleep ESFP, right? So I'm still playing the observer card a little bit, but I'm gathering instead of organizing, okay, making progress. And I'm prioritizing my own values, feelings, what I like, et cetera, over something else, right? Over what, what the tribe needs from me. Okay, we're making progress. And now that I've started to do that, and now I'm feeling comfortable with that, now I can actually start to, to play the IP game, which doesn't just mean doubling up on my FI. Because now I'm at a point, again, I'm not a master at it, but like, I can double up on my FI. That is a thing that if if I if I you know there I, I recognize that I can I'm still gonna have to check NT and ST blast play boxes, but there is now a finite number of those boxes to check, right? Still probably too many. I could probably trim that down to like three to five, but like you know, right now there are eleven boxes rather than infinite number of boxes that I'm constantly obligated to, right? It's like, all right, I got to check these 11 boxes and then I can SFNF. Cool, making progress. Again, we're going to work on paring that down, getting that to like three to five NTST, just the most important things. And then, you know, working on the other stuff. Cool. But man, a big part of that is learning how to play the decider game, which is super duper painful when it goes badly, but it's a really important game to know how to play. 
Because I was thinking about this, uh, in, for those who don't know, I was talking about, I've been thinking a lot about marriage lately. Um, and where I kept getting tripped up is in this idea of like the institution of marriage versus who I'm actually getting married to. And sort of realizing that my biggest issue was that I was trying to that I was thinking about getting married. Um, and part of this relates to what Aaron Alexander was talking about with like false summits. But for me, the big problem was I was putting so much emphasis and importance on the thing, the institution, the, you know, the, the abstract concept th that I was foregoing and completely ignoring and sidestepping why one might even want to get married. And so now I'm sort of at a point that I kind of like, which is if somebody asks me, do you want to get married someday? I'm going to be like, I have no idea. That's not a real question because I don't actually think that is a real question. Do I want a partner? That I think is a more real question. I would contend that partnership can take many, many forms. I think it doesn't have to be romantic partnership. I think it can be um, intimate friendship. I, again, I think it can take a number of different forms. Um, parent, child, like, you know, some sort of bond. Because really what, what I want to be asking myself is like, do you want to bond with somebody? Uh, yes, obviously, because I'm a human. And once I can really distill it down to that, to do I want to bond with somebody? Do I want to make the decision to align myself with a person? Once I can do that, right? Once I can start to frame the world that way, now it's going to be a lot easier to be like, yes, no, 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 yes, no, no, yes, no, 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 yes, right? In this case, I'm not talking about dicks. I'm talking about romantic partners. If you haven't seen History of the World Part 1, you should see History of the World Part 1. Very funny. Anyway, point being the more I'm like, okay, what does being an IP really entail? Because I'm not going to play the EJ game. That, again, that can get into dicey territory. Um, that's sort of my like release lever of like break EJ glass in case of emergency, like when everything goes fakakta. Okay, fine. I will, I will put on my blast play EJ hat, deal with the thing, and then go back to this other thing that's harder for me. Great, cool. And so now that I'm in IP land, and now that I'm like, here are the things that I just like to do, and to force myself to like the things that I'm liking doing, right? And not questioning them, not trying to risk reward them, not trying to like optimize them. That's a big one. And obviously, optimizing can take many, 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 many forms. But for me, I'm not trying to NT-optimize the things that I'm doing. I Because the, the muscle that I need to build, the habit that I need to get into, is this habit of, oh, liking something that isn't theoretically perfect is not, again, like, uh, that's not even the question, right? Like, I have to stop myself before finishing that thought because it means I'm on the wrong track. It's recognizing that liking something and it being abstractly perfect and optimized, they're on completely separate axes. And so, sure, I do absolutely need the broad strokes of NT in my life, right? 
it would feel really, really good to run down Wilshire Boulevard in the middle of Beverly Hills naked. That would feel really, really good to me. Okay, maybe don't do that. That's maybe a bridge too far, right? This, like, that's where the NT needs to come in, right? Because now it's like, does this affect anybody else? And I think that that is fair. I think that it is entirely reasonable and fair to go, okay, here's this thing that I like, that feels good, that, you know, I just want more ice cream. I just want as much ice cream as I can have, right? Being able to go, okay, hang on a second. Is anybody affected by this ice cream? Like, is my eating all this ice cream negatively, like, is it endangering myself? Is it putting somebody else in jeopardy? And, and again, I'm not talking about the teeny tiny minute. I'm talking about, like, for instance, I love, like, homemade pasta. Oh, man. Give me, like, a thick cut al dente, um, with, right, with a big fucking wide noodles and a meaty ragu sauce. Maron, right? But I got to be real careful about how much pasta I eat because I have a grain sensitivity. And if I eat a lot of grain, then future me feels shitty. So, like, yes, me doing this thing hurts somebody else, and that somebody else is future me. And I like future me. I don't want him to, to be in pain. I don't want him to suffer. So, like, I have to do things that are in my best interest, even if they momentarily feel good. Like, no, it, that's actually a destructive behavior. Probably shouldn't do that. Um, because, and again, in this case, this is not an instance of like, I can have a slice of pizza. I can have a little bit of a pancake, but like, I cannot have a bowl of pasta without unduly hurting future me. Like, I have done this multiple times. Future me is always really mad about it. So I just, that, that's a thing that like I don't do, right? Same with drinking, right? That hurts me. When I drink, I suffer. So I don't drink, like I can't do that. That hurts me and I'm not going to do it. And it hurts the people around me too, right? Because I don't have to do it responsibly, so I don't get to do it. But once you get past that tier of like very obviously harmful things, like me sitting and playing video games doesn't actually hurt anybody. It just fucking doesn't. It doesn't even hurt my bottom line because my tutoring job is so it's sort of like a you know not a lot of hours but good pay but the work that i do is like you have to be very 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 present for right so it's not even interfering with the mechanics of my life it's not like i'm playing video games 40 hours a week instead of looking for a job right the big picture stuff is just taken care of. So why am I concerned with getting more NT granular about it and trying to optimize it when that's no longer serving me? Like, I really am fine. And that's a hard thing. Maybe, maybe this is a me problem, right? This might just be like a Raja issue. But one thing that I see a lot in, from the people who are, you know, playing the observer game a lot, is there really is this intense perfectionist, perfectionist quality of, okay, let me gather more because what I have isn't enough. Hang on, this plan, this isn't perfect. It's vulnerable to an attack from this angle, an attack from this angle. It has to be bulletproof. There's a thing that... Um, I bring him up a lot, but I bring him up because he's my unofficial type twin. Uh, my boy, Keegan Michael Key. He talks about what really excites him. Um, he talked about this on Mad TV, but especially Key and Peel is what he calls bulletproof sketches. Sketches that are just fucking airtight sketches. Like, 
perfectly constructed sketches. And man, did he succeed. I know I talk about substitute teacher all the fucking time, but it doesn't get better than that. Like that is in the echelon of like Monty Python parrot sketch. Like that sketch is fucking flawless. And that's great if you're writing a sketch comedy show. Terrific. That's a perfectly acceptable context to try to do the thing. But you don't have to do that in every aspect of your life. And again, again, maybe this is a me issue. One of my, what I'm realizing now is one of the biggest reasons that I've been struggling in the last couple of years is because work and home, like that partition is really, really blurry. And yes, you can do the sensory things of like, I'll, I don't answer work emails on my phone. And actually that is a thing that I did for a while. Um, I did not have email on work email on my phone. I was like, it can fucking wait. Nothing is happening. I need like a part, like I need this partition divider, whatever. But a lot of it is that my, my observer qualities that were extraordinarily useful in business were killing me in every other aspect of my life. And so part of why I needed that business partition was I, what I was really trying to block out was just my over dominance of observing. And it was like, all right, well maybe if I can take all of this observer energy and just put it in a box partition it off, then maybe I can work out this other thing. That's really what I was trying to do. And now that I'm in LA, and especially with the coronavirus, that has been taken care of for me. I am now able to, like, I don't feel that I have to be living in a hardcore observer mode all the time because the world just isn't demanding that of me, right? The world isn't demanding anything of me. The world isn't really demanding anything of a lot of people, except for our medical professionals. God bless you. Please keep doing what you're doing. Like, I can't even imagine what y'all are going through. But like on a macro kind of cultural level, so many societal expectations I feel have fallen by the wayside. I think that's really, really great and important and good and we need to start to break those down. And what that's allowed me to do is actually focus on not just my FI, but focus on my FI in the context of being a decider and being able to go, you know what? I don't care where this is going. This human matters. As long as I align myself with that human, we're good. Right. And to go back to the marriage thing, you know, one of the biggest issues that I had and sort of stumbling blocks and roadblocks was like, how am I, how can I in good conscience get into a relationship with the intention of marriage if I don't even know where I'm going to be a year from now, let alone what the world is going to look like five years from now, let alone 35 years from now? because fucking, I don't know, we could be on, you know, moon colonizing people, right? And what I'm now starting to realize is that it's very obviously the wrong question, but I see where the question is coming from. That question is coming from this idea of, like that is an observer question. Marriage as an institution, marriage as a concept, marriage as an end goal, working toward an end goal, and that's something, it's funny when I hear about like someone like Gary V, he's really casual about it. And it's why he's able to create that rhetoric of, and sort of lean into that of like, you gotta have an end goal because for him, A, he's demon preaching, right? Because he's savior, double activated, masculine SE. But it's also in the middle of his stack. His NI is in the middle, even though it's only single activated. So he can 
comfortably and confidently be like, have a plan, have a goal, because he knows he's never going to get more than like 60, 40 when it comes to that, right? He's still so solidly EJ that him going all in on having a goal, having a plan on playing the thing game, his version of all in is still perfectly healthy. In the same way that my version of going all in on you know, the IP EJ game, and particularly my FI, my, my FI is so weak at scale, com not necessarily compared to other observers with Demon FI, but like compared to all the IPs out there, compared to fucking everybody with Savior FI, like, yes, I am definitely on the bottom half of the curve. So I don't have to, I don't, I'm not worried about going too far on my DI as long as I'm playing the tribe game. I can absolutely go too far if I'm stuck in the observer game. Now I'm fucked, right? Now it's risky. But if I'm going all in and, and like committing to playing the decider game, it means necessarily that I have to keep my observers in balance. Okay, now we're fine. And now I can just be like, I like this. I like ice cream. Today for dinner, I'm probably gonna have a frozen pizza. Why? Because I fucking want one. Because I bought, you know, six frozen dinners last week and haven't eaten any of them because uh, they ended up being more expensive than I thought. But also, I just fucking want one. I just want a frozen pizza for dinner and it doesn't fucking matter. It's fine. The world is not going to end if I have a frozen pizza tonight. And I have to stop myself there because my impulse is to go, no, okay, let's be reasonable. You can't have frozen pizza every night. No, I already fucked it up, right? I have already, I've already lost the game. By the way, anybody born in the late 80s, you also just lost the game. You're welcome. Anyway, sorry, I lost the game earlier today and I have to pass it on. So fuck all of you and fuck anybody who watches this video in the future um, around the 37 minute mark. That's just a thing that's gonna happen every time you watch it and there's nothing that you can do about it. Sorry, not sorry. So if I'm playing this game, right? It has to stop at, I want a frozen pizza tonight. End of essay, not end of sentence, not end of paragraph, not end of chapter, end of essay. I want frozen pizza tonight, period. Because I trust future me, he can handle whatever the fuck, okay, I gotta walk more, right? Or the gym will open, or it won't, fuck it, I don't know. Tonight I want a frozen pizza. I'm having a frozen pizza, fuck it, I might have two, if that's what I feel like doing, right? And part of why I have to, I have to like force myself to be irresponsible. Not responsibly irresponsible. That's where I get fucked up in the, in the beginning. Like, I just need to make the broad, make sure that the broad strokes of, and incidentally, this is a cauliflower uh, crust pizza. So I'm not eating the grain. I'm not drinking. I'm not doing anything that future me can't handle. Right now, me, present Raja me, wants at least one frozen pizza. And so I'm just gonna do that. And then future me will take care of whatever he needs to take care of. And if it becomes a persistent issue, fine. A month from now, I'm happy to look back and go, ooh, it's a lot of frozen pizzas, right? Or how about just uh, in the shopping that I do, I just, you know, I can look at, I save my grocery receipts, right? Anytime I go shopping, I will know, like, that's a really good time to maybe turn on the NT a little bit, to, to turn on 
the, uh, the analytical, to turn on the observery part of, of my brain, and then trusting that, okay, once we're home, you do whatever the fuck you want, right? Mom has bought all of this food, right? Kid tested, mom approved. I'm the kid. Mom is past me. It's like, all right, I bought all this food. Eat whatever the fuck you want. The next time we go out shopping, then we will have this conversation again. And it's fine. It's all going to be fine. So with that, I hope you have a wonderful evening. I'm going to go make a frozen pizza.